We are so excited to be here um, spotlighting Attorney General Loretta Lynch. Um, Attorney General, you have been such a strong leader throughout your tenure and have really led the Justice Department through some truly divisive issues from the Dakota Access Pipeline to Ferguson. How do you as the Attorney General approach these conflicts and what are your top priorities in, in navigating some of these issues? Well, thank you for having me, Taylor. I really appreciate this opportunity to sit down and, and speak with you. When I think about the issues that you've mentioned, Ferguson, Dakota Pipeline, you think about what they have in common um, are people really trying to gain access to justice, justice as a concept, as an ideal. When I'm in the middle of a situation where there's conflict like that, I try and step back from it, actually. I mean, obviously, as lawyers, um, myself and my team spend a lot of time poring over detail and fact and nuance, but sometimes to really come to a solution, you gotta pull back and you gotta see what is the real issue here? What does this person really want? What's really missing? from this situation. Um, and when once you understand that, then you can craft a solution that hopefully will give both sides something that can resolve their issues. Or you can at least explain to the losing side in a principled way why they're not gonna prevail that day. So when we were looking at Ferguson, for example, we had spent months negotiating with them. Um, and we had come to agreement on the basic principle which was that every citizen in the town of Ferguson, Missouri deserved constitutional policing. Whether you live on the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks, you know, whether you were, you were a teenager you know, looking uh, to start the job uh, market or whether you were an established uh, you know, person who had been there a long time, that as a matter of principle, everyone deserved constitutional policing. So then the, once you establish it, the issue is how do we get it for everybody? And when things began to fall apart, what we tried to do was to push the city back toward that unifying principle. It's like, look, we've all agreed here that constitutional policing is our goal. And the issue is how do we get to it? We can talk about strategy, we can talk about cost and all those other issues, but we cannot deviate from this common goal. And when we felt that Ferguson was deviating, that's when we felt we had to, to essentially litigate the matter. Yeah. But we were able to resolve it, um, again, by getting them back to that common goal. Yeah, well, speaking of common goals, um, you recently traveled to Harvey Milk High School and the Stonewall mm -hmm. Monument in New York yes. to shine a spotlight on hate crimes against yes. LGBT Americans. We have made a lot of progress in the last decade, but there's been some serious backlash with laws like the North Carolina bathroom um, yes. issue and the rise in hate crimes. Um, what can everyday Americans do to ensure safety and freedom for their fellow citizens? That's the best question of all because really, our safety and freedom are everyone's responsibility. They really are. The Department of Justice will always be there. We will always look at these larger issues. But by the time a matter gets to us in litigation or conflict, someone's been harmed. Mm -hmm. Someone's been discriminated against. Uh, when, in the issues that you're talking about, particularly when it involves our LGBT family members and friends, our transgender family members, youth, young people who are dealing with issues of identity, um, they've already been traumatized. So the first place to start is in your own community and make sure that it's as open and inclusive as it can be. And it isn't even a matter of saying I have to understand or agree with everyone. As a matter of saying, again, the unifying principle is we all deserve to be here. We all deserve to live freely. We all deserve to live in safety. And look at that person and say, if they were my child, how would I want them to be treated? By the school system, by their friends, by their peers. I'd want them to be accepted. I'd want them to be safe. I'd want them to feel that when they go to school, they can grow and thrive like everyone else. And then make it so for every child that you know. Every child has to be our child. So it really does start with the individual. And then you build out to the community, to the organizations, to the school districts. Mm -hmm. You know, Make sure that your school district knows it's important to you that every child feels welcome and feels included, uh, whether they're your child or not. And when that's your unifying principle, all these differences that we hold on to, they fall away. They are not important at all. When you think about what we all want to have, we all want to have a safe place to live and a safe place to raise our kids. Yeah, certainly. And speaking of 
safe. One of the things that you, that the Justice Department under your tenure has really been on the front lines of is um, criminal justice reform. And I'm sure you know that the number of women in prison has been increasing at a rate 50% yes. higher than, than men since 1980. So during your tenure, you've been a vocal advocate not only for improving our reentry process for prisoners, but also shutting down unsafe private prisons. So what do you, what do you say to the people who don't, you know, consider ending mass incarceration to be a women's issue? Well, one of the things that we have to point out is the number that you just mentioned, is the huge increase of women who are incarcerated, and also the collateral consequences of that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, obviously it's, it's shattering to a family and a community when you incarcerate a father, a husband, a brother. But often when you incarcerate a woman, really you almost incarcerate a whole family. She's separated from her children. She's separated from being a caregiver to parents. She's separated from her community. Uh, and the community as a whole suffers. So when we look at these issues of sentencing reform and mass incarceration, the issues of how they involve women have to be in their front and center as well. We've been doing a lot of work in this area. I'm, I'm tremendously proud of the work we've been doing. We were hopeful that we would get sentencing reform passed in Congress. It's, it's unfortunate that that did not occur, but it had bipartisan support. We're hoping that that debate continues. But my view has been, if you can't achieve on the larger scale, what can we achieve on the smaller scale? As you mentioned, we've been looking at private pris prisons. Are they safe? Do they do the job of rehabilitation uh, and holding people accountable that we need them to do? And where they don't, we'll not, we won't be engaging them any longer. But looking also at what we're providing in prison, in terms of what kind of educational opportunities we're providing for people whom we're gonna have custody and care over for a significant number of years. How are we equipping them to go home and be better community members, family members, parents? So we're working on educational opportunities in prison, we're working on employment and training opportunities in prison so that when everyone comes out, they will have uh, an equal opportunity to contribute. It's been part of what we're looking at, really looking at the entire criminal justice system. Criminal justice reform lets us um, reinvest dollars that are being spent towards mass incarceration in reentry programs, in diversion programs, in strengthening law enforcement. I've also spent a lot of time working on the issues of the relationship of law enforcement and the communities that we serve. I've done a 12 city tour looking at those issues also. Yeah, it's it's really incredible all that has happened in the last in the last two years. And the, our last question really that we ask everyone, it's it's quite open ended. It's what do you want the state of women to look like? I'd like the state of women to look like a place where young girls can look up and see themselves reflected in the people who run our institutions, uh, who run our agencies, who run our country, but also the people who run our communities, the people who are making change, who are driving change. I want them to see that, and I want them to see that um, they too are gonna do that one day. Not that they can or should aspire to, but that they will. They will be in those positions one day, and I want them to have those models to do that. I've been fortunate enough to see so many outstanding women, ranging from the women who helped me lead the Department of Justice, to the outstanding women law enforcement officers I've worked with, to the young women who are leading these efforts for reform, for change. I want young girls to see that, and then I want them to step into those roles and own those voices and run the world. Oh, wow, how amazing. What the no better way to end it. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Taylor.